Uh, it, it's just beyond the cloud, you know. It's still there. Um, it says, you fool. Don't get offended. It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's actually a scripture for today. You fool. And uh, obviously, you know, no one likes to be called you fool. Uh, I suppose it all depends. Um, I, I, I think that today it may not be prudent if you want to say something, you approach a person and say, you fool. Uh, I guess it sort of it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, if you're talking to the young millennials, you better watch out. You can't start like that. You have to say it very nice way, you know. Uh, but the, the baby boomers and beyond, I mean, we're so used to bullying and people calling us by all kinds of nicknames. And nobody called us by name when we were little kids. Um, you were so used to being bullied, you know. Um, I remember... Um, Names like like uh, high school and junior high school, people calling each other like Dork and Dimple and Twinkie or even Scarface. Even if a little Scar, they'll call you Scarface, and they don't call by your first name. And uh, I can see that young people have no idea what I'm talking about, but the older people, I know what, what you mean. Um, <clears throat> You know, in millennials today, it's all about self-esteem. You're good, you're good, even though they're bad. Even though you come to the last place, hey, you have hope, you're, you're going to be okay. It's like, all the kids are growing up thinking they're okay, but they're not, you know. You fool. That's kind of thing that we really want to say, but you don't say it. You say, you can do better, you know. You have hope. And I suppose that's okay, too. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, Remember Mr. T talking about bullying, you know? Next slide, yes. The Mr. T, I mean, you know, some of you don't know what it is, but the most, of it have, most of the people who are in the, I suppose, in the 40s, maybe 50s and 60s, and we kind of grew up watching this uh, TV uh, episode of Mr. T, and Mr. T is a very gentle guy, you know? He's, he's still gentle, but... Whenever he wants to say something, he says, you fool. That's his famous line. It's like uh, the apprentice, you know, the, uh, the Trump, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, who's featured in his big line. People are just waiting to hear, you're fired, you know. And it's like the, uh, the Mr. T, meaning that I think there was a, the series called The A-Team, The A-Team. And uh, people, uh, he would always say, when he wanted to make a point, he would say, you fool, you know. Um, I suppose you can get away with it uh, in those days, uh, but today I suppose. But he, you know, because he was kind of a gentle guy, but when he says you fool, you, he, what he really means is, hey, pay attention. I have a point to make. Please try to listen. But underlying is like, I, I care for you. I, I love you. I need you to change your uh, ways so that we could just fight this thing together. And that's what he means by you fool. There's so much meaning in you fool. Well, in, in any way, um, having said enough about you fool, but if I go back to uh, chapter 3 of Colossians, and it goes kind of say the same thing. You foolish Galatians. You foolish Galatians. That's the chapter uh, 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 3 and verse 1. Uh, exactly that's how it starts. But I want to uh, just, just talk to you more about the, uh, who the Galatians were. First of all, when the Bible talks about you fool, okay, and we have to understand that it is still the word of God. The Word of God. And the Word of God is good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and, and, and doing all this for the righteousness. So this, you foolish Galatians, has lots of meaning to it. It's trying to correct and rebuke and teach into the righteousness to, this pe to, to people. So that question is, who were the Galatians? A little bit history lesson would be nice. And I think I presented this about several months ago when I was talking about some other topic about who the Galatians were. 
Well, Galatians were Celtics. Have you heard the term Celtics? Um, they influenced much of the Northern European way before Christ. And you heard the name Celtics, right? The Boston Celtics. Well, you know, it's kind of like that when the founder of the Boston basketball team, uh, I think his name was Mr. Walter Brown, and the people are saying, well, we should call our team like Olympics, unicorns, world wins. They got all kinds of different names. He says, no, I'm not going to do any of this stuff. Uh, looking at the people in the Boston, the lots of people in the Boston are Irish. And I'm going to call that Celtics and put on a green uniform. It's sort of, sort of like referring to Irish. But people in Ireland were influenced by the culture of Celtics. And Celtics are kind of uh, people uh, also known as Galatia. It was originated in the northern and central Europe, and they migrated and expanded their influence uh, to, to west, to the island, to Wales and England. They all have very similar cultural background. And to the southwest, they went down to France and even to the Portuguese. And to the east, they went as far as Turkey. And those who remain and reside, it is what is Turkey today, are known as Galatians in the Bible. So technically, Galatians are Europeans in origin, not Asians. And the Greeks called them, because Greeks did not get the influence of Celtics, because they're away in the south. The Greeks called them a barbaric people. Well, a lot of people were barbaric in those days. Uh, you know, maybe because Greeks and Romans are a little bit more, they considered themselves, at that time, even though they did a lot of barbaric killings, but this daytime because they felt they're a little more civilized, they had a little more poly, uh, government going on, they felt that uh, those who didn't have that was barbaric. And I suppose whenever we think about barbaric people, uh, they tend to be uh, very simple-minded. You know, those who are like bullying type and this, uh, those people are really gentle, like, like you know, just, just gentle. They're simple-minded. They're very royal. And at the same time, they're very fearless because they got one goal and one purpose. And therefore, they're very much influenced by other people or by other leaders. So the story is this. That story is that these Galatians who came all the way down to the Turkish, that little uh, upper left picture, and no, upper left, yeah, upper left image, and that image at the very lower right, that little tiny uh, brown uh, uh, area in the midst of the white, that white is the Turkey, and that's where the Galatians reside. And the Bible is talking about the people there. So they migrated. You can see that the right image shows how they migrated to different parts of the Europe and Asia, uh, the Celtics, the influence of their culture. The story is that these Galatians they became Christians. And they received Christ through grace with the help of Paul. And when they first received the grace, they were convinced that they received grace through the Holy Spirit, not by work, only by faith. They were convinced of that. Because that's what Paul says he seen them receive grace by faith. So later on, when Paul returned back to them, and they were not quite the same. Things got a little twisted a little bit. Things got a little changed. And the way they lived, the, the life is Christianity is not the same. You can think of it like today, like when you go to church, and you know it's a Church is supposed to be a spiritual, uh, uh, a filled place. And then we talk about, often about legalism. 
uh, too much legalism going on in our church today. Well, that's kind of similar. It's, I'm not saying it's exactly, it's very similar. There's too much of that other influence causing them, you've got to do these things in order for you to, be, uh, uh, to receive the grace. And what Galatians were doing, they were trying to conform to the ways of the life of Jews. In other words, they're observing the law. Oftentimes, like I said, we call them sometimes when we try to observe certain law, certain ways of uh, things, we call them a legalism. In one particular case, in the first uh, two or three um, topics, when we're talking about Galatians, Paul often talks about the issues with the circumcision, because that's the tradition of Jews. So in first one, Paul says, seeing all this, he said, you foolish Galatians. And he can't believe it, so he just keeps on going. He doesn't stop at you foolish Galatians. He says, who did this to you? Who bewitched you? Look what he said. He bewitched you. Who influenced you? Who have you been hanging around? Who has wronged you? Who was the author of this false teaching that you have been receiving when I left you? And say, don't you remember the essence of death of Jesus on the cross? It's, it's Paul's way. It's his, like, his dramatic way of making his point to be very clear to them. He wants to make a point and in order to make him poem, he's just saying, you foolish Galatians, pay attention. I have something to say to you. You must change up. That's the, his point. So what is his point? His point is the cross. The cross was to separate us forever from the curse and the bondage of law. That you Galatians and all of us, the Gentiles, even the Jews are free from the law. You are free from the previous way of life. Therefore, as Gentiles, you do not need to observe the traditions of Jews. And I suppose this is what we discussed last couple of weeks. In the Galatians, the chapter before, Galatians 2.16, no that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So what he's really saying is, you fool Galatians, now you need to go back. Back. How can you go back? How can you go back to that law when you have already received grace by faith alone? So, verse 2, he says that basically what he's saying is Let's go back in time. Let's go back in time. It's like us, we us telling each other, let's go back to our first love. First love in, in Christ. When you first fell in love with our Lord. When you receive the grace the first through the Holy Spirit, how did you receive it? Was it by doing or simply by believing. And he concludes saying, it was by simply believing. You didn't have to do anything. You believed and you received. So verse 3, he continues on saying, again, so don't be foolish. Don't be foolish now. You understand this. Don't try to attain what you're trying to attain or try, the goal that you're trying to attain with the human effort. This justification, the grace, you cannot get it with the human effort. And uh, verse 4, 
Have you suffered so much for nothing? In other words, when they first received and they first became Christian, they got persecuted. Lots of families, uh, members, when, when you receive Christ and you're the only one uh, uh, becoming Christians, you're, even your family members begin to uh, persecute you. My father was persecuted pretty bad. He grew up in a village where no one was Christian. He was the only one. And in those days, we talked about bullying it, kicking people out, keeping family of the kids out was normal. You are going to believe Christ. You leave home. So my father was kicked out of his home and he's out of village. That's why he had to go to Busan. And we didn't have any ties in Busan from somewhere Gochang, you know. He was in Gochang, and, and, and Gochang is about an, an hour uh, uh, northwest of Busan, which is the second largest city. And he was kicked out, never to be invited back. And uh, in those days, uh, things were a little, you know, this so-called the, the law or the, the legalism, the ways of life was a little tough, and the, that's what they did. And um, he was persecuted. And they're saying, you were persecuted. If you go back, to the law. That's like all that persecution for nothing? Come on, wake up, you fools. That's what's basically what Paul is saying to make his point. So verse 4. Well, that's exactly what we said. Verse 4. And uh, verse 5. Does God give you his spirit and work Miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you have heard? The answer is by hearing about the faith. That's how you receive the grace. When you hear the message today that Christ is the Son of God and you believe, you receive grace. It's not about what you have done. And that's the point that Paul is really trying to zero in to the early Christians. And he makes a case in the verse uh, 6 and 7. He makes a case by saying that Abraham was a, our father a long time ago, even in the Old Testament. He was justified in the same way by hearing of faith. Because Abraham believed he was accepted. And when you believe in faith alone, then you become the children of Abraham. Now verse 8 and 9, as we go towards the end, it's really the topic kind of related to justification. So as we talk about verse 8 and 9, we'll talk about justification a little bit because that's the few jargons and words in Christian. Lots of people don't quite understand what is justification or what is a sanctification. It's a, it's a big word, and lots of people don't really understand, but it's really simple. We'll get to that. In verse 8, it's saying basically, God already knew this was going to happen. God knows whenever we have a difficulty trouble that we face in our lives, God already knew that this was going to happen. So he prepares for it. So whatever challenge you're going through right now, God already knew a long time ago that this is going to happen to your life and he's giving you the proper understanding and is giving you the so-called the seed for you to, to move on. Is saying in verse 8 how Abraham was saved by faith. How saying will the nations be saved by faith? Who will be blessed? All nations will be blessed. But through Abraham. And who are the Gentiles? Who are all descendants of Abraham. That's why God gave the gift to Abraham. That you will be the father of all nations. 
And God blessed him. Not just to the Jews, to all of us, the descendants of Abraham. So he says, those who have a faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham is known as a man of faith. Not just the man of doing the good words, the man of faith. So, we are all justified. Even the Gentiles can be justified by faith. The teaching of justification by faith is what separates Christians from all other belief. In other words, in every religion, man is working his way to God. In all other religion, man is working, doing something his way to God. In Christianity, man is saved as a result of grace through faith, not from work. The word justified means pronounced or treated as righteous. The moment we believe, we are pronounced and treated as righteous before him. So let's look at where the justification is clearly uh, told. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's kind of prelude. In Galatians 3, 24, uh, 25, so the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. You may be a little confused, but verse 25 seal it, seals it. Now that faith has come, now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. In other words, faith, justification, comes before so-called sanctification, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by words, so that no one can boast. Titus 3, 5, He saved us. Not because of righteous things that we have done. He said, not because of the righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. Mercy is something that we do not get even though we deserve the punishment. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renew by the Holy Spirit. Once a person is justified, there is nothing else he needs in order to gain entrance into heaven. The work has already been done by our Lord Jesus Christ. See, so that this justification is God's act of removing the guilt and penalty of sins, while at the same time making a sinner righteous through Christ. So then you may say, okay, I heard the term sanctification. Or what is sanctification? The best way to put it is that sanctification comes after justification. Once you've been accepted, once you've received uh, a, a grace, and then word comes. Remember I talked about often? The Bible is very clear in other places in the Bible. Salvation, justification is faith but also faith without work is dead is when you are already being justified. Remember when Paul said faith alone, he was talking to non-believers to save them. And then when he was talking to faith without work is dead, he was talking to the believers who has already been justified. So justification is completed work of God. It is instantaneous as opposed to sanctification, which is ongoing process of growth by which we become more like 
Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 23 clearly states that may God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept. Kept is sustaining, maintaining, working on it to be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our role now has to, once we are justified, once we've been saved, we need to go through the sanctification process. In other words, we need to work on the law that it's been defined to us so that we can be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in that sense, we've got a work to do. Paul is trying to separate the two. I am right now talking about justification. How do we be in one with Christ? You can't work for it. You can only be saved through faith alone. Sanctification occurs after justification. While justification is a one-time act of God, sanctification is a continual process until we are taken to be with the Lord. Here's the one best uh, description that I've seen uh, written by someone named, forget the first name, White, that appeared on... um, the uh, Herald Review. I'm not sure what kind of uh, uh, literature this is. It's back in 1895. This is what it says. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. I'll tell you what imputed means later on. The righteousness by which we are sanctified is imparted. The first is our title to heaven. The second is our fitness for heaven. That's wonderful description of what Paul is trying to teach Galatians. Don't get confused with the two. I'm talking about God. The first is about receiving the title to heaven. The second part, the fitness, I guess we'll talk about a little later on as we continue with this series on the uh, Galatians. Imputed. The righteousness by which we are justified is imputed. Imputed is meaning is something like someone has already done it. Someone has already given you credit. Imparted is meaning is to become, is to make, is to pass on. It's a continuing a process. So the first is the title to heaven is a gift as having credit to us. It's like, you know, my daughters, they want to go somewhere. They say, I, I got no money, so I have to work for it. And I don't usually do that. I just say, okay, buy me a plane. I mean, buy me an airplane ticket. So I buy them airplane ticket on behalf of them so that they can travel. That's a free gift. It's a free gift. Until they start making money, I suppose it's a free gift. I'm kind of waiting for them to get a job and getting a big money so I don't have to afford them anymore. That has become sanctified. You have to work for it. But until you get to that point, until you're justified, okay, it's a free gift. So you can travel. The second, our fitness for heaven is to live to be like Christ. That means you have to work for it. It's like she gets a free plane ticket. She's in the air. The point here is when you're in the air, behave. In other words, you have to work for it. So you got the free ticket to go somewhere and you're in the airplane for a free ticket. That means you don't get it, you know, have some appreciation and behave. Be nice citizen. Be nice person. Stick with the law. There are a lot of laws once you get in the plane. You can't get up, certain things. You've got to turn off your phone and 
you know, turn off the phone. Don't get up and, until you're allowed to. That's a law. Another way of to look at, looking at it is uh, like some people like, like picture description, right? It's like wooden post. It's a wooden post. You see a wooden post? You have a dirty wooden post. And the one is right is the clean one. So they have a, 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 a wooden post. The one on the left is dirty. So you go and paint the outside. You remove all the stains and spots. It looks nice on the outside. But pain does not change what is inside. When we are saved, the inside of us, meaning that the fact that we are sinner, does not change. But God accepted us just as we are. What a comfort that is. Doesn't matter what have you been, what you have done, even if you don't forgive yourself, God is saying, I will accept you just as you are. Just believe in me. That's what justification is saying. Justification is saying, I will take it, I will take you and cover with my blood. So that you are credited, you are imputed to receive the title, the right to heaven. This is justification that Paul is trying to teach the Galatians. Just to clear up the matters of sanctification, which we'll talk about next week. The best way to describe that is if you look at the tree. Some trees are good looking and some trees are pretty hideous. Uh, some old ones are rigged and rough. But look at inside. You know what flaws in the tree? It's called sap, the liquid, sticky thing. The sap flows from the vine into branches, and it imparts, it passes on, it makes, it, ma- it, it helps to become a new life within. It does not cover up outside, but changes the inside. The pain changes only the exterior of the fence, while the sap in tree changes the inside, the interior. Therefore, sanctification occurs after justification. In other words, the work comes after we're being saved. We are justified when our body is covered with the blood of Jesus. In other words, the wooden post or the fence is painted to cover up the defects, so that we can be new again, like a righteousness of faith was imputed to us, cover up all our past sins and hide them forever. So this is justification. And after that, then the Holy Spirit working in us can help us to sanctify the inside of us to be new again, like the sap in the vine. So living a victorious life that we all desire to live a victorious life is to have the righteousness of Christ, which is his life, imparted to us as sap is imparting to the branches. And this is called the work, the sanctification. The Lord does not want us to continue to sin. That's not what he wants us to but he desires to impart us with his life so that we may live a victorious life. So here's the conclusion of the matter of Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 10. The conclusion of the matter is Paul saying, you foolish, 
That's not just you foolish collections. That's us too. You foolish. You fool. And the one simple, big question, how important is the faith? The answer is, faith is the only way to God. And we'll talk about the importance of law the next time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. 